wanted to thank everybody at the Walker Art Center for making this possible. I'm delighted to be back here. Do you know it's been 20 years? You came in 1988 the first time? I've been here since then, however. Yes, yeah, so you've been here. Uh, oops. You, you came in 1988. You came in 1992, um, I think. You came in 2000, and you came today. So it's so our 20th there you go. anniversary. It's our 20th anniversary. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we're really happy that you're here. And I, I know this film leaves you, at least when I first saw it, it leaves you with quite a, uh, a, a lot on your mind and, a, and, a, and sort of an intensity. So I think while we maybe take a breath and let you, you all gather, you're, you're um, coming back into this space from where you've just been. We can talk a little bit uh, to get started about your, your relationship to each other. Of course, this is Errol Morris, of course, and this is Nubar Alexanian. I want to welcome, welcome you both to the walker. Yeah. Newbar's photographs are in the art lab, which is, as you leave, are right around the corner. And I hope that you'll stop and see them uh, before, before you leave tonight, because they are photographs that were taken uh, during the production of uh, standard operating procedure. And also, as I mentioned in the front of the evening, that he has his new book out, which is the uh, photographs made on the sets of Errol Morris films for the last 15 years. You guys have worked together for 15 years. <laughs> it's odd, maybe not so odd. I have a book coming out which is essentially written by Philip Garevich. My name is on it uh, because it's all my work, all my interviews and research. Um, and of course, there is uh, this book by Nubar Alexanian, which I'm proud to be associated with. I adore Newbar and his photography. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, Philip Garevich and Newbar Alexanian uh, came into my life at exactly the same time. Uh, Philip, who is now editor of the Paris Review and a staff writer at the New Yorker, uh, worked uh, at the Forward. Uh, it's the Jewish a daily paper in New York. Uh, this assignment from the New York Times to write on Brief History of Time was his first job uh, for a major newspaper. Uh, and the photographer who was assigned to do the pictures for that article, it ran in the New York Times magazine, was Nubar Alexanian. So I met them exactly at the same time, and I've known both of them. Uh, as friends and as collaborators ever since. Mm -hmm. And the books are coming out at the same time. The books are coming out roughly <laughs> at the same time, yes. And when I met Errol, Errol asked me after we started shooting, we shot for a couple days and, on this story, and um, he asked me if I would shoot on his, do stills on his movie, which was, that he was working on then, which was Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. And I said, and I really liked, liked meeting him, and we had a great time, and I love his work, but I said, no, I can't do that. I just can't do production stills. And on, and on a film set, you know, a, 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 a still photographer is like way down here. What all people want to happen to the He can't really go low enough. But <laughs> I think you understand the basic idea. <laughs> right. So, you know, all that people want the still photographer to go away. And, 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 and I like to wander and just make the pictures that I make. So I said, no, and he said, no, 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 I don't mean, I, wa I don't want you to do production stills. I want you to shoot whatever I'm shooting in any way that you want. And I'm gonna cut your pictures into my film. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. So we started that way, and it turns out that Errol couldn't figure out how to use them, but we've continued to work together for 15 years. And the thing I, of the many things I love is the story about you know, an AD on a set is the person who's responsible for keeping things moving and keeping the pace moving so that a certain amount of work is accomplished. Assistant day. director. Assistant director, yes, thank you. And every single AD on every single set would go up to Errol eventually and say the same thing. They would say, Errol, isn't there something we can do about the still photographer? He's <laughs> slowing us down, he's always in the way, isn't there something we can do? And Errol would always say the same thing. And he would say it really loud so that everybody could hear. And that would be, well, if you have any suggestions at all, I'd really, really like to hear them, because I've tried for years and I don't know what to do with them. 
And it was his way of saying, you know what, he can do what he wants to do and go where he needs to go. Um, and so I was able to produce these pictures of him and his work um, over a 15 year period that built toward um, you know, the standard operati operating procedure pictures. And it was all, it's, so it's simply because of his willingness to let me do that. I don't think anyone, any director has ever allowed anybody to do that like that before. Maybe. Sh should have done more with him, really. I <laughs> am a little disappointed that he hasn't been on every single film that I've done. Um, I habitually produce too much material. That seems to be an occupational hazard of at least my filmmaking. Um, I've been left with a feeling after every film that there's this huge uh, mass of material. Uh, I was going to say morass, probably that's more accurate. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. It's not in the movie. The movie represents a, a small fraction of the whole. Philip Garevich, when he started work on the book, said to me, are you aware, it's one of those are you aware conversations, are you aware that there is between a million and a half and two million words in these transcripts? Uh, to give you some idea, the, uh, the uh, transcripts dwarf the Manhattan telephone directory. Well, but you, you interviewed Janice Karpinski. For, we were there for, what, two days, 12 hours a day or something? Uh, only a total, I think, somewhere between 17 and 18 hours total. That um, one interview was that long. It was amazing. And uh, I had thought, this was, again, the very, very first interview that I did for the movie over two years ago now. Um, the pictures had always been on my mind. I had been thinking about photography. I'd been thinking about the Abu Ghraib photographs. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with all of this. Um, I thought maybe I can make an entire movie out of Janice Karpinski like I made an entire movie out of Robert S. McNamara. And so uh, we just went on and on and on and on. An interesting phenomenon. Uh, Janice Karpinski started off angry and got angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. Um, and the last, oh, I don't know, three or four hours of the interview are really quite remarkable. Most of the material that you see in the movie uh, comes from the very end of that interview. Uh, uh, what about the other people that you interviewed? Were they willing to come forth? And um, they obviously went through quite an ordeal, uh, not only making being there, documenting being there, then getting most of them had jail time, and then now are talking about or, or you're engaged in talking with them. Um, this question about whether it was easy to get these interviews, there's a simple answer: no. <laughs> no, it was incredibly difficult. It was the wrong word then, but <laughs> no, no, no. I used the word. I don't think yeah. you did. <clears throat> um, I think just incredibly difficult. Um, they, these... seem, they seem so forthcoming in a way, and I don't know. Again, you talked about how much you, sh you shot of them, or that you how much footage you probably might have had, but that it feels like they became more and more relaxed about talking and telling. Stories. Yeah, but that's after like 12 hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it yeah. varies with each person, yeah. but I mean, I, I remember Lindy England was, I think, a very big surprise because she was so present. Well, here's a person described as retarded, hillbilly, um, monstrous, and she comes into the studio and, in fact, she turns out to be quite articulate. Uh, everyone was surprised. It came as a big surprise to me and uh, everybody who was there. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, the tricky part of investigating with a movie camera, I did this in the Thin Blue Line, and I did this in standard operating procedure, the tricky part, of course, is finding people, getting them to agree to be interviewed, and then bringing them. I don't go to them. Uh, after I did the Thin Blue Line, uh, where I was traipsing all around Texas, uh, trying to find people, I decided I'm going to make this much easier on myself. <laughs> I'm going to bring them all to me, uh, put them in a studio, um, shoot them in sets, shoot them against backdrops, shoot them against a white psych. Um, in this instance, we had uh, Newbar also made ample use of it, this painted backdrop a concrete wall that came from, I just have to give them a plug, the Schmidley Corporation. Um, I've wanted now for years to do their advertising. Um, uh, you know it's good because it's a Schmidley. Um, we had the Schmidley. Uh, we took it with us. We took the Schmidley to LA. We took the Schmidley to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Most of the interviews were done in Boston. Um, and it's a big deal. It's a big deal because often uh, each one of these people would come with a lot of other people. It was part of, part of making this whole thing work. Uh, Javal came with his chief investigator and his attorney. Lindy came with her attorney, her attorney's wife. Uh, her mother, uh, her son Carter, um, uh, a big deal. Each of these interviews was uh, uh, a big deal in and of itself and trying to make all of it work uh, difficult. I didn't know that I would have Lindy England in this movie until very late in the game. She was in prison, I had no access to her, the military authorities would give me um, nothing. I wasn't allowed to write to her. Um, uh, we just simply had to wait until she got out of prison and then hope that she would, she would agree to an interview. But part of it, part of it is this interviewing machine, the Interatron, which I use. Um, it's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting deal. Uh, Newbar, for as long as I've known him, has been trying to get the perfect Interatron picture. It's like this uh, search for the grail. Um, don't, don't even get me started. <laughs> how, do you, how do you film the Interatron? Something, by the way, that I didn't, Patent. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you before. Yes, you have. About, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I, go ahead. He's to blame. Well. No. <laughs> well, you can see that we have. A disagreement. A disagreement about this. <laughs> no, but I mean, you have to, you know, it's a teleprompter so that people, if I'm talking to Errol. Two teleprompters. Two teleprompters, right. But, but for the person who's being interviewed, <laughs> they're seeing Errol's face on a piece of glass that's covering the lens. So I'm gonna take a, I wanna get a picture of what's that, what that's like. And I've shot it, I don't know how many times, I finally got it with Sabrina. I think that one does it, don't you? I think there are a number of great ones. No, no, that one really does, though. <laughs> we, we can talk about it later. <laughs> but I wanna well, just tell it one no, story. No, no, no. No, wait, hang on a second. I wanna, what, did you wanna finish? No, no, no. <laughs> No, so I, I just, as a still photographer, I just have to say this. I mean, and, I, and I've been doing interviews lately, and people always ask me what it's like to be shooting on an Errol Morris set. And I've always wanted to give this answer, but I felt like I couldn't do it unless I was in your presence. So after this, I can say it probably to anybody. Oh. But when, when people ask me about that, I often tell the story, I'd like to tell this, I often would like to tell the story about Gary Winogrand. I mean, it's different, first of all, when I'm on set with Errol and he's interviewing. It's always the same setup. 
So my problem is, how do I make a picture of this person who's different than the last person, but in the same setup? It's not an easy task. So that's one problem. But then the other is... He's making excuses. <laughs> but then the other thing is the set. So we're, we're on a set in, a, in, in, in L.A. Where he's recreated the entire Tier 1 Abu Ghraib cell block exactly. And reenacting... It's on the set where they shot I Love Lucy. Right. <laughs> so, here, so here's what it's like to work on an Errol Morris set that's a re recreation. Gary Winogrand, I don't know if you know who he was, he was a very famous, amazing photographer, uh, somebody who I knew personally. When he taught at the Graduate School of, uh, at ID in, in Chicago, he, he, he said to his students, you can go and photograph anything you want except for dog shows. No dog shows. And the reason is, is because at a dog show, there are pictures everywhere. And that's what it's like to be on a set of yours. There are pictures everywhere. So if you look at my book, you see that I've been shooting for 15 years, right? And half the book takes up the 15 years. And then the other half takes up five days on the set in LA. And everywhere you turn, everywhere I would turn, there was a picture. And it wasn't for, it took me a, a bunch of years to really understand that Errol's movies are not about what we see, it's about what people say. Because it was always, to me, about what people, what, what, what I was looking at. Because it's so rich and it's so deep and it's so complex. And the truth that he tries to deal with is not a simple truth, it's very complex. And so he weaves it in ways, I mean, if you look at the pictures that I have that are here, some of them, you'll see, I don't know, I have more waterboarding pictures than you do, by the way. I have in my book, than in your movie, because he didn't use as many. But I mean, you'll see how many different attempts he makes at trying to describe for viewers what this is like. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some very, very, very beautiful, I hesitate to use the word, but it's true, some very, very beautiful waterboarding sequences. Um, This whole reenactment question, I mean, it's central to Newbar's book. It's one of the things that's interesting about the book, which is called nonfiction, is that he's actually uh, taking pictures on my sets. Um, one of the oddities, so certainly looking at your pictures makes me think about this all over again. One of the oddities of taking a picture on a set, of course, is that there's something real there as well. Um, uh, that all photography is this odd combination of the contrived and the real. My favorite picture in the book, it's one of my very favorite pictures, period, uh, is this picture of Fred Lucher in the Tennessee death chamber uh, outside of Nashville. Uh, and F Fred and uh, I have gone down to Nashville to film a sequence with his patent pending electric chair system. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows about this movie. Mr. Uh, Mr. Death. <laughs> Mr. Death, a title which I would love to change. Mm. But Fred was, uh, <laughs> yeah, my wife wanted to call it What Fred Said, and there was another uh, title that I really liked that comes from a line that Fred did say in the course of the movie when he talks about his honeymoon in Auschwitz, and I thought that was a perfect title for this story. <laughs> um, <laughs> honeymoon in Auschwitz. Um, so we're down there, I mean this is one of my great experiences, we're down there in the execution chamber. Fred has already received a lot of adverse publicity as a Holocaust denier. Go figure. And the warden down there doesn't really want to be seen with Fred in public. He doesn't most certainly want a picture taken of himself with Fred. Uh, you know, I don't think he has that much of a problem with what Fred was saying, but he knew enough 
best not to be photographed with this man. So he locked us in the death chamber. He locked us in the death chamber. That's true. New bar, uh, uh, Bob Richardson, his gaffer, Ian Kincaid. You were there. Uh, I was indeed there. Um, <laughs> But then we couldn't leave to get anything. To, we couldn't leave to do anything. You have to order. We had to order. order in. <laughs> yeah, you have to order in to the death chamber. Uh, we got pizza, didn't we? Yes, we, we ordered did. out for pizza. <laughs> you know, please deliver uh, cheese pepperoni pizza to the death chamber. <laughs> we'll be there all afternoon. <laughs> And this is so, how my shooting started with Errol, uh, like in this death chamber. Wasn't that the first place we went? Of course, there was the New York Times article that preceded that, but that might have been one of the first times that we, we worked on a movie together. Right, it was pretty strange. Um, Fred, oh, okay. I'll stop in a okay. second. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, I just, I'll you back to this I, movie. In it, 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 it brings <laughs> back such happy memories. And... Um, Newbar took a whole number of really wonderful uh, photographs of Fred. Uh, and Fred is sort of servicing his electric chair, demonstrating the protocol, what you do to make sure that your electric chair is in fine working order. Um, and that it's humane. Well, that's one of my favorite uh, oxymorons that comes from um, Fred Lucher, painless executions. It, uh, it takes the ouch out of the death penalty. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not even talking about this movie. <laughs> We're down there, one story, and then I'll stop. We're down there, Fred smokes like a chimney. You know, he, he, part of uh, the Fred Lucher legend, he smokes, you know, I don't know how many packs of cigarettes a day. I don't know how many cups of coffee he drinks a day, but a lot. Um, it would kill instantly uh, an ordinary human being. Every time Nubar tries to take a picture of him while he's smoking, he immediately puts the cigarette out does not want to be seen. It's the power of the photograph. It's the power of the photograph. Does not want to be seen. Why? So I ask, thank you for setting this up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Why? Why? So I ask, I ask Fred, uh, why don't you want to be photographed with a cigarette? And he takes me to the side. He gets very, very, very serious. And he tells me, you have to understand. I'm a role model for children. <laughs> it's, a true, it's a true story. It's a true story. S swear Sorry. to God. Put me on a polygraph. <laughs> so let's go to the, the power of the photograph. <laughs> and especially in this film, if we'll learn, come back to this film, because it's about the photograph and about this, the act of photo, you know, making the photographs, and the, well, the activity that was happening to be photographed, the, the reason maybe to document it, to have some kind of proof, uh, um, so there's sort of an awe. I mean, it, it's very odd what happened there. And was that what intrigued you to this, the Abu Ghraib photos? Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, there's an inherent mystery. There's an inherent mystery in every photograph. Um, uh, these photographs, are, to me, are even more mysterious because everybody has seen them. They're the most widely seen photographs in history. I don't know how many people have seen the picture of uh, the hooded man on the box with wires. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have seen this photograph. It's the iconic photograph of torture and abuse. It's the iconic photograph of the Iraq war. And on the other hand, we know nothing about it. That's what's so endlessly have, fascinating to me. Well, we, when, when you say that, though, it, you mean when we first saw that picture, it looks like he's connected up. It looks like if he falls off the box. All the assumptions that one makes, right? From, without any extra information, just what the picture provides. 
We know nothing about the context of any of these photographs. We can imagine a context, as we almost always do when we see a photograph. We see a photograph, and there's something about the way in which our brains are wired. We uh, provide a story, a storyline. We caption it, if you like, uh, mentally. Uh, the only problem is that the mental caption that we provide, the imaginative caption that we provide for a photograph, may really have nothing whatsoever to do with the circumstances in which the photograph was taken. I have been writing a series of essays for the New York Times. Uh, I have this essay that I'm trying to finish. It should go up sometime at the end of this week or early next week. Uh, on this one photograph, um, it's the photograph of Sabrina Harmon. It's in the movie that you just saw. She is smiling, thumbs up, corpse of uh, Iraqi prisoner below her in the frame. Um, in fact, she talks about the smile. Uh, it's to me one of the great lines, I know it looks bad. Something of an understatement. Um, I know it looks bad. One of the interesting things is the pictures all got lumped together. Uh, more and more of them came out, uh, but they were of a piece. No one really thought to say, uh, are there differences between them? Uh, uh, how and why were they taken? When were they taken? The picture of Sabrina, I don't know, you have to tell me. This is a question, okay? I need to get something out of this, rather than just the sheer enjoyment of showing my movie. <laughs> but and being with both of you. <laughs> and, and this group. And this group. Yeah. Have I left out anybody? No. no. Um, uh, do you get the idea from looking at this movie that when Sabrina took this picture, uh, she was taking a picture, perhaps even for forensic purposes, the pictures of the corpse. By the way, there are over 20 of these pictures going into detail, uh, photographic detail, the injuries uh, to uh, the dead Iraqi prisoner al-Jamadi, Minadal al-Jamadi. Uh, cartilage of his nose crushed, broken lip, cracked uh, teeth, horrible contusions, bruises. Um, Sabrina had been told by her commanding officer that this was a heart attack victim. Um, she had nothing whatsoever to do with this man's murder. You look at the picture and you think body, smile, thumb, complicit, evil, bad, but when you start to break it all apart, how odd that the CIA could murder a man, they could kill al Jamadi in cold blood, and that the person that would get the blame is Sabrina Harmon. To me, at its core, and this may not come as a surprise, I'm a connoisseur of sick stories. This is one of the sickest. Um, uh, what I've been writing about in my essay, uh, I've been writing about the Cheshire Cat, well known because the Cheshire Cat vanishes except for its smile, all that remains is this smile grinning at you uh, up in a tree. Uh, this photograph is very similar to that. All that remains in the end is Sabrina's smile. 
We know nothing more about the photograph. Uh, we remain blissfully unaware of the photograph. Uh, and somehow the real crime vanishes. It uh, remains unobserved, unrecorded, and I might add, most significantly, unpunished. Um, but in many ways, you just answered it when you said she, that she produced 20 forensic photographs of his death. If not for her, wait a second, how did I answer it? Well, but, but you were asking everybody. Well, 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 yeah. What was your question to everybody? Was it clear in the movie that somehow she wasn't complicit in this? And, and did you hear that from the letter? From the I letter. did. Did you believe the letter? Yes. Oh. Some people believe the letter, and some are saying no. But the question. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Could, but, could be. Okay. Because of it's almost as dual nature she has in it. She has these very earnest and very sincere letters where she's she totally knows how wrong all of this is, and and on this one. On this one hand, she's a documentarian, but then on this other hand, we see her as a participant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ain't that troublesome. Mm -hmm. Could I just say one thing about questions? We have a couple of microphones on each side. But I know, I would like, I just, to, yeah, I'd I'd like, like to, to if we could. Answer, but just, I just for the next question, or to, to step up to the microphone, then, then they'll be able to hear Can it. Can I as ask well. them a question? I just, did you want to answer that one yet? Chris? This one? Yes. <laughs> we need your answer. Yes. Please. So do you feel like the pictures that she took, she was taking as evidence of what was happening? Yes. No? no. no. no? Yes. Let me hear, yeah, let me hear from, uh, from a yes person and a no person. Okay. Take but you have, you have to go to the microphone, though, please. Oh, come no. on. No, 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 no just talk. We'll just... I'm just saying, I don't, I don't think we have to know. That's the beauty of the song. It's not really that. Right. Why, why don't you... Because Well, wait a second. Wait a second, <laughs> ma'am. I am, you're looking at one truly confused human being here. <laughs> I don't purport to have the answers. I find this whole story deeply disturbing and puzzling. Um, I gave it to my editor, uh, Elizabeth Shelburne, and she said to me, you know, at the beginning of the essay, you say you're going to tell the reader why Sabrina is smiling, and I don't feel that you come through in the end. Uh, you have identified a major problem, but it's one thing to say, I don't know, and it's another thing to say that an answer is unimportant or somehow can't be known. Uh, I sometimes think of people. Um, we would like people to be one thing. This person is X, that person is Y. Um, I think of people differently. I think of them almost like a deck of cards um, with all kinds uh, of different personalities, not multiple personalities, but different aspects of who they are and how uh, they present themselves to the world. Uh, Sabrina is really interesting. I mean, it's amazing that these letters exist, these letters which are contemporaneous with the photographs. You want to read someone telling you that these people are devoid of moral sensibility, you know, wrong. Morality is all over the place there. That's what's so unbelievably bizarre and disturbing. Sabrina can be addressing all of these issues. I know it's wrong, blah, 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 blah. I'm taking these pictures to expose the lives of the military. Uh, and at the same time, she seems to be a participant in many of these scenes. Realizing that she's in the army, she has no control. They're 
doing these horrible things. She has this girlfriend elsewhere to whom she can write. So I think it's perfectly possible to have three completely conflicting things going on simultaneously. But her last hope is to carry out, carry out the documentation of these events so that she can actually say to the world and say to her significant partner in the United States, I am telling you what the, the hell that I'm going through. And she is documenting it, and it's, oh, she says it over and over. Is she successful? There's, there's no, there's no, she's there's no confusion about that. I'm posing, and that's a trophy. <laughs> Let me add, because I like, uh, I like what both of you have said so much. Imagine also that Sabrina is torn. Uh, she wants to prove that she is tough enough to be in the military. She wants to be tough. She wants to be strong. She isn't. She isn't particularly tough. She isn't particularly strong. I'll give you one additional piece of information that isn't in the movie. Uh, I had this fantasy that I was going to have t only two prisoners in the movie. And the two prisoners were the man who was actually under the hood on the box with wires, who was known as Gilligan, and the man who claimed that he was on the box under the hood with wires. Uh, one was known to uh, the guards as Claw Man, the other as Gilligan. So I had this picture of a debate between Claw Man and Gilligan arguing about who was the perfect victim, the unknown victim. It's kind of like the unknown soldier. Um, I interviewed Claw Man in Amman, Jordan, and I asked him about Sabrina. Sabrina uh, was supposed to watch uh, Claw Man that night. And Claw Man said, you know, I really, really like Sabrina. She's a good one. I thought, well, that's really nice to hear. I kind of like her, too. <laughs> Why did you decide not to include that interview? Too much stuff. Also, that came from another character who was separate from all of these characters. You have to set the character up. You have to prepare the audience for something that is really disparate with all the other material in the movie. Easier said than done. It makes a good story in a Q&A, not such a great story in the movie. Um, I detect something here. <laughs> I would play the fifth. No, no, no. I, um, I think that uh, this question should be uh, constructed in a slightly different way. And if you don't like it, you can stop me at any time. Uh, the pictures, not all of them, but many of the pictures that became the most infamous pictures of Abu Ghraib, uh, the most well-known infamous pictures of Abu Ghraib, are pictures with um, uh, American women in the military. Uh, Sabrina Harmon uh, and Lindy England. I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and it's a reason that goes beyond, in horror, anything you're suggesting. Um, I, I believe, uh, at its heart, this is a war of sexual humiliation, um, uh, in which American women have been very, very badly served. Um, just think of the war for a minute. I mean, we're talking about a war where 
a country of 300 million people had no foreign policy other than to kill Saddam and to show him uh, in the interim before we killed him who's boss. Shock and awe uh, is a story about one country attempting to humiliate another country. Um, it was policy, a policy of our government, yes, our government, to use American women to humiliate Iraqi male prisoners, strip them, hood them, um, When Grainer took that picture, the picture of Lindy England with Gus on the leash, um, several things you should know. It wasn't a leash, it was a tie-down strap and the procedure had been approved by medical authorities at the prison. Gus, who was later shown to be innocent, the guy the end of that leash, had been on a hunger strike. He had stopped eating. He had to be force-fed. He had to be fed uh, uh, with an IV, uh, fluids. Uh, one of the soldiers told me just to irritate him even further, they would paint uh, a Star of David on the IV bottle. Um, he was so weak, they had to move him from one place to another. He could hardly move on his own. Um, Grainer took this picture. Lindy herself asked, well, why did he take this picture? I'm 90 pounds, 20 years old, uh, scarcely five feet tall. Um, uh, it's a picture of a little girl, a little girl dominating an Iraqi uh, man. Uh, and in a way, it captures to me the essence of the war. Um, one more story, well, maybe more than one, but uh, about this, uh, I was at the MPAA in LA trying to get a rating for the movie. Every movie in order to get distribution has to be vetted by the MPAA. And the head of the MPAA and I were talking about the photographs, my desire not to fuzz them out or to change them in any way, because they're evidence, they're at the heart of the movie. I started talking about humiliation, my, my theories about humiliation in this war uh, and she said, funny thing, you know, horror movies since the beginning of the war have changed. Um, the movies that we see now are essentially about humiliation. Uh, you kill people, of course, but first you degrade them. Uh, I found that endlessly interesting. Uh, a story of humiliation, re-humiliation, humiliation again. We try to humiliate Iraq. Um, the pictures come out of us humiliating Iraq and humiliate us <laughs> and the government. We humiliate the soldiers who took the photographs because, make no mistake, the crime here has nothing to do with anything that's portrayed in the photographs. The crime is photography. These people were punished for embarrassing us. That is the real crime. If you want to ask yourself why, why uh, is the CIA interrogator who is responsible, at least in part, for the death of al Jamadi, why has he never been charged? And why was Sabrina uh, uh, threatened with prosecution for taking uh, that picture? Because the crime is photography, not murder. And that is pretty sick and pretty amazing. Will you wait for the microphone? Yeah, that'll help everyone else be able to hear. Thank you. Um, you mentioned yeah. how difficult it was to wrangle these interviews and that people would show up with their sort of entourage of 
who knows who. Um, I'm wondering if you're aware of any like techniques that you were using when you were interviewing these people to get them to be so raw and real about the most intense experience of their lives. I mean, it feels like people are really going deep, and I just wonder if that's just naturally you that brings those out in people, or if you're or if you're aware. I use that tech, the Interatron, I rip it off all the time. And I have to be you know, aware of what's on She's my face. She's the only person who rips it off, by the way. <laughs> Nobody else. I mean, anyway. It's but. unpatented, by the way. You know why it's unpatented? And I was going to tell the story before. But, but I interrupted. When Nubar stopped me so conveniently, um, you have a year after the first public mention of the device to get it patented. Um, in the article uh, that Philip uh, Garevich wrote for the New York Times and uh, uh, handsomely uh, accompanied by photographs by Nubar Alexanian, there was a picture of the Interatron identified as such. And I didn't realize it, but um, uh, I had a year, like a clock, tick, 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 tick. I had a year from the day that photograph was published. Uh, you know, I have this fantasy Wait a that, minute, so you're, you're, that's my fault? <laughs> I told you, I told you I was blaming you. Oh. oh, I didn't realize that, thank you. You didn't know this? No, I didn't know that I was responsible. It's really not his fault. Does, but can it, I answer, does, it, can I, does it admit, yeah, to the I, question? Can I answer her question a little bit? Sure. I, I just, can I, 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 he should answer, but what I'd like to say about your question is this, that the thing that's really interesting about watching Errol interview these people is that he, he's extremely well prepared, but he doesn't really know what they're going to say, so he doesn't prepare questions, right? Never prepare questions. So he, and it's, an, it's like photographing. It's like you can't know what's going to happen. You don't. So he, you don't he interviews know. people for hours and hours and hours, knowing as much as he can about them, but letting them talk. And these people just talk. And the lawyers are sitting right there, and In another room. trying to censor them. My experience with lawyers, that lawyers pay attention for the first 10 minutes it's true. for <laughs> The successive 15, 16 hours, they tend to lose interest. And then, and, and then they're, they're wondering where craft services is. They're, look, <laughs> they're looking for their next meal. Right. That has never really been a problem. I'm perfectly happy to have anybody, well, within reason. Um, I mean, it does get absurd. But no, uh, I... I always think an interview is going to be bad the minute somebody takes out a list of questions that they're going to ask me. Um, God knows I have myself been interviewed many times. Um, Philip Garevich told me something that I did not know because he had mm, pouring over all of these transcripts and he said to me, uh, I did not know this. He said, do you know that you always say the same thing at the very beginning of every interview? Um, and I asked him, what is that? And he said, you always say to people, I don't know where to start. And I looked at it, and in fact, I always do that. I always do the same thing. I don't know where to start. Help me, please. Okay. For God's well, let's, sake. Let's, should we go into, to, should I lead you into, uh, what about just the whole thing of reenactments? Because so much of this film, of course, you've reenacted all of these things that have happened. And yet, I think this film feels very much like we've seen something very honest, maybe, something very truthful. And yet, we know, of course, it's a film and it's been very made and it was, these pieces were all reenacted, that these, uh, this isn't a, straight documentary from, from this place. You have a set, and you have actors, of course, being in, in, in. So where do you sort of go between that line of honesty and well, truth and reenactment? I've written a series of essays. This is part of what I've been writing for the Times. I actually wrote a two-part essay on reenactments. Um, 
And it ends with an effort to remind people that everything is a reenactment. Uh, consciousness is a reenactment of reality inside of our skulls. Uh, none of us have privileged access to the world. We construct the world for ourselves out of bits and pieces uh, and a semblance of the whole. The interviews, by the way, I would take issue with that, but all right, it's okay. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, well, is it different in photography? I mean, the things no, that are I was still gonna versus the things... No, I was going to joke, but it's also true. I, I'm, I'm a, I don't ever ask anybody to do anything for my cameras unless it's clear in the pictures as in a portrait. So you doing these reenactments, but I'm not asking anybody to do anything. You ask people to do things all the time. I never do. Wrong. I have never Absolutely done wrong. Never once on your set, except, no, there is one. When you took portraits of me. No, of portraits, of course. I just said that. Let's hold this thought for a moment. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, when someone is talking about the past, when Lindy England or Sabrina Harmon, uh, uh, they're taking you back two, three years to the events that occurred in Abu Ghraib. I'm interviewing them in 2007, 2006. Um, they are reenacting for themselves and for us what happened years ago. I mean, it's memory. Um, uh, the only real direct evidence that we have from the past is the photographs. Um, oddly enough, we never think about verbal reenactments. We always think about them as somehow being visual in nature, but they are reenactments nonetheless. Um, it's probably a bad choice of words in the end. Um, they work in so many odd ways, but never to show you what reality is like. You know, I don't have, you know, Darwin, you know, and the Galapagos suddenly discovering the meaning of natural selection. Um, what I do have, I'll listen to an interview. I'm sitting there. I'm as trapped as the people that I'm talking to. Uh, um, I'll sit there and I'll listen, and I'll hear lines that just leap out at me. They just come to life in some crazy way. They are visual. I don't know any better way to describe it. I remember sitting, uh, interviewing Robert McNamara, and Robert McNamara starts talking about automobile safety. This wasn't even the first interview. I think it was the second or third interview I did with him. And he said, you know, he wanted to, uh, put seat belts in cars, padded dashes, collapsible steering wheels. And so he was dropping skulls down the stairwells at Cornell University, padded skulls in order to test his various theories about how to make automobiles safer. Uh, I hear this story and I think, wow, <laughs> he's dropping stuff from the sky even when he's saving lives seems to be a <laughs> bodus operandi. I've got to illustrate okay, this. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not illustrating in some way what I think it looked like. I don't care what it looked like. I don't mm -hmm. care what skulls he used at Cornell University. Um, I like the idea, the idea of these uh, skulls falling from the sky. It seems well, the, to be a very powerful kind of image. But like it, so how does that, talk, can you talk about the egg in this film? Yeah, I love that story like from Tim Dugan. He tells me about the Saddam knocking on the door and saying, I am Saddam Hussein, ruler of Iraq. You know, I, see these, I see these people in there. So, but no, but I mean, can you? Can you, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but you, but you want to shoot. But you shot the egg. 
that way because I also, by the way, the sentence. I also, I also imagine the little lady and the guy having these arguments. You know, he's been here for two weeks. He doesn't clean up after himself. <laughs> He doesn't talk to us. He's a really, really bad guest. Tell him to leave. If you're half a man, you tell him to leave right now. Say, well, but dear, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's Saddam Hussein. I don't know if I should tell him to leave. And besides, this is his house. No, but so, but, but why, the egg. Why, why the egg? I mean, I love the egg, but I'm not sure I know why I love the egg. I hear this stuff. Don't ask me why. I'm not sure. No. Uh, it, 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 Dugan tells this story about Saddam. And you see an egg dropping through a glass He says plate? he comes in. He wow. says he comes in. And he cooks himself. An egg. An egg, not two eggs, not three eggs. He cooks himself an egg. I see, I see the guy offering him a second egg. <laughs> you know, big mistake. You know, like I believe I said I wanted one egg. Is something wrong with your hearing? No. And the idea of this one egg. So yeah, my should. wife very cynically says, and every time I start a movie, she said, what kind of falling liquid are you gonna have <laughs> in this movie? I know, but, you, but isn't that, it's like you're sh shooting through a glass thing and it's falling at a, like a thousand frames per second or something? Well, the Phantom V9, my big discovery, right. uh, the slow-mo camera of my dreams, a thousand frames a second, and you get to see it instantly. It's instant gratification. Um, you used to have to wait. Now, bam! And so we shot the egg. You know, when you shoot something like this, you want to get a couple of angles on it. <laughs> it's like the, uh, the car in the Thin Blue Line. You want to shoot underneath it. You want to shoot above it. You want to shoot here, you want to shoot there. The egg, we had a half a frying pan so we could get the camera right in there. Um, you want to be looking up at the egg as it falls. You want to have that side angle. <laughs> Just got to have that side angle. Um, yeah, you want, to, you want to cover it completely. <laughs> I'm sorry, I asked. <laughs> and then you got this scene. Right, right. It took me a long time. Does it work for you in the movie? Do you like it? Yeah. Oh, good. It took a long time. It didn't work. I had it at the very beginning of the movie. I but put it here. I like put it, it there. But does anybody know why they like it? Because cool. it's cool. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, I would agree. That's with the that. correct answer. That's the correct answer. <laughs> it's. Cool. And I would, I would put this scene with the egg. I cut it so many different ways. You know, because we built. I know, because you dropped more than one egg. Yes, we dropped more than one egg. We built part of this Saddam's kitchen. <laughs> Finally, I made it work. I think it works now. But I got, you know, take the egg out, please. Do we really need to see that? It doesn't make any sense. I think it does make sense now. And it goes with the hanging. I like the fact that you see the egg dropping and then you see the body dropping. Yeah, I have a lot of things dropping. I can't <laughs> help myself. That's, they, call it, um, they call it art. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I came up with this definition of art that I kind of like. Um, which is uh, set up an arbitrary set of rules and then follow them slavishly. <laughs> That's it. You, know, you don't really need to know more. Drop a lot of stuff. That's my, to young filmmakers. <laughs> Dropping things. Drop a lot of things. Are there other questions out here? If somebody want, would like to, take the microphone. Somebody there we go, right over there. here. Great, terrific. You did some very interesting graphics to show the 
um, the timeline of the three cameras and the alignment of particular images, particular incidents taken by the different photographers. Would you like to comment on whether the availability of mass reproducibility on an electronic scale as opposed to the reproducibility of, of film photographs has had a bearing on this incident and how you felt that you should treat that in the film? Well, of course it has a, a bearing on this. Uh, we've gone through, a, we are continuing to go through a digital revolution. Um, uh, it's possible to send photographs around the world uh, instantly. Photographs are no longer printed, or most of them are not printed. I still love uh, analog photography and printed photography, but most photographs today are not printed. They exist on screens of one kind or another. Um, that's a big, big, big difference. Uh, everybody is taking pictures. I don't have any facts or figures. Um, cameras were actually sold at Abu Ghraib. You could buy a camera, point and shoot. Uh, and of course, many of these soldiers, not just the soldiers that are in this movie, many soldiers took pictures. Here's something that really interests me, though, beyond that whole digital revolution and the fact that um, you could both take and send photographs in a different way than has ever been done before. Uh, Susan Sontag wrote this essay, appeared in the New York Times Magazine, one of the last things she wrote before she died about the Abu Ghraib photographs called On Regarding, or on regarding uh, the Torture of Others. Uh, I suppose a companion uh, piece to her book on regarding the pain of others. And she remarked, it's the first time I actually read it in print, um, she remarked that a lot of these photographs were posed. Um, uh, I think of these photographs as having uh, three different varieties. They're documentary photographs, verite photographs. When Sabrina uh, arrives at the hard site in the middle of October of 2003, she sees taxi driver naked, stress positions, uh, underwear on his head, and she takes all these pictures. She writes about it. Um, pictures as evidence, pictures to expose the military for what it is, uh, to show others and perhaps also herself, because there has to be an element of disbelief in actually even seeing these things. She takes these photographs. Then a different kind of photograph emerges, a photograph um, where the American servicemen are part of the scene, uh, prisoners, uh, an American, usually acknowledging the camera, smiling, thumbs up, very much aware of the camera, posing, posing for a picture. Uh, look, Ma, <laughs> um, uh, Kilroy was here, um, having a great time, <laughs> uh, wish you were here. You see those photographs, uh, the thumbs up picture with Al Jamadi is, is a perfect example of that sort of thing. And then a third kind, the most bizarre of all, uh, that I think about quite often. Uh, I call it the, um, the tableau vivant, the Cindy Sherman from hell series of photographs where scenes with the prisoners were orchestrated for the purpose of taking photographs, that these things perhaps would not have even been done if a camera had not been present. The pyramid, to me, is an example of that kind of thing. Um, you create something so that you can take a picture. Uh, 
and look at it right away. Well, here's one of the, to me, the most fabulous and interesting photographs at Abu Ghraib. There were three pictures taken of Gilligan on the box. Uh, three pictures of the guy, hood, wires, uh, blanket. Actually, Grainer made the blanket for him, cut a hole in it, and put it on him as uh, a you know, serape to keep him warm. You look at these photographs, and there's that possibility they put the wires on his fingers so they could take the photograph and then took the wires off immediately afterwards. Um, he also, in some way, is recreating the idea of the war. Um, again, going back to this idea of humiliation. Uh, that clearly involves women. No accident that they're part of these pictures. Um, and if the original question was, why did you focus on the women? Because they're central to this story. And to not focus on them would be to deeply miss the whole point. Um, so just think about it. Think about those three uh, kinds of photographs. Um, it's all very, very odd and all very mysterious and all very troublesome. Hi. We have more questions over, oh, right in the middle here. Okay. Speaking of blame, I've heard people talk about the prison thing in the context of prison experiments in California during the 70s that people thrown into a situation uh, ultimately become part of how disturbing that situation will be and uh, I was wondering if the people in the, that you interviewed felt that they were somehow thrown into this disturbing situation and therefore that it, it manifested despite any uh, moral sort of disagreement with what was going on. Everybody is addressing my pet peeves here. It's <laughs> fantastic. Um, my compliments. We handpicked this audience for you. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, he is referring to the Stanford prison experiment, the so-called SPE, uh, conducted by a Stanford uh, psychologist, uh, Philip Zimbardo. Um, social science is always trucked out. There's a little dolly with wheels and people bring s s social science out on the dolly. Particularly when they have problems with disturbing stuff. And this is, if anything is disturbing stuff, this is disturbing stuff par excellence. So let's go get the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, Zimbardo had done this experiment where he had recruited various uh, students and workers at Stanford and created a faux prison um, with guards and inmates and watched as this whole thing uh, devolved into nightmare. Uh, now, what is this experiment supposed to show us? Um, that environment can influence behavior. I'm not going to argue. Uh, does our environment influence what we do? I think, in fact, it does. It would be really puzzling to me if it had no influence at all. What that exactly explains, I'm not sure. Here's the really interesting part of the story. Zimbardo was engaged to be married. Uh, his intended, who is also a psychologist, she's now a professor, uh, Christina Maslach at 
University of California, Berkeley. At a certain point, she said, what you're doing is unconscionable. You've got to stop this. Um, and so he stopped. Uh, to me, the uh, SPE, the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, proves something other than what it's supposed to prove. It proves that if you really want to marry your girlfriend and she doesn't like your satanic experiment, <laughs> maybe you'll think twice about it. I hate, okay, as long as we're on the subject of stuff that I hate, <laughs> oh, I hate simplistic solutions to the problem of evil. I hate them. Someone came up to me, I showed the movie in Washington, D.C. I've lost track because I've gone here, there, everywhere. Uh, someone comes up to me and she trucks out. First of all, she tells me I'm a writer for Vanity Fair. I suppose I'm supposed to get down on the floor and grovel. Um, she tells me <laughs> about... Um, you didn't? I don't mind groveling, but only under my... <laughs> I like to choose where and when. Um, she she uh, trucks out the great Hannah Arendt lie and the banality of evil. Right? Banality of evil is supposed to explain something, I guess. So you see something that makes you nervous, something that seems like a no-no, and you pull yourself together and you look really, really, really smart and you say, perfect example of the banality of evil. And I think to myself, perfect example of the banality of talking to you, and I'd like to stop as soon as possible. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, one of the amazing things about Hannah Arendt's original book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, was that it was perverse. It was ironic. She talked about the banality of evil as the absence of something, not its presence. Um, things that she expected to see that she didn't see. Uh, that's a big, 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 big discussion. I should write my essay on Zimbardo and Milgram and uh, the banality of evil. But ultimately, we haven't described anything. We've just kind of passed the buck. Also, look at these letters. This is someone wrestling with the problem of evil. I don't see its absence anywhere at Abu Ghraib. I see some tortured, convoluted uh, set of moral questions being constantly raised, uh, toyed with, acknowledged. Um, you go back to the th thumb. I should come up with some explanation for the thumb, and if anybody has an idea out there and can help me out with this essay, I would be really, really deeply grateful. I'm serious. Um, how to explain, how to give an account for the smile uh, and the thumb. I just know one thing is banality of evil is not going to do it for me. When you're saying that this entire war is about is about sexuality and and degradation, I think the thumb is all part of that. That there's some way of talking about sex without it being sex, and the smile and the thumb are completely tied up with that. I don't know. I need to think about it, but I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. No. Well, well I have this. Can I ask you a question about? something different, which is about the destruction of the photographs. So when, um, I can't remember who's describing the moment of the amnesty when all the images can be destroyed and you represent it by that pile, 
filling up the... Thank you very much for commenting on it. I, um, I should let you finish your question. I'm sorry. No, no. I just, I, I, I just wanted you to talk about, or just talk about, you know, what remained. There, I mean, because, of course, not all the photographs got destroyed, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have them. So, um, what... You know what? What was your thinking about filling up the room, but not it never quite filling up, and and the idea of what got remained, or am I misreading what you're? Doing? No, 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 no. You're not misreading anything. Um, uh, my wife, by the way, hates that shot. She kept telling me, "Take it out of the movie. You can't use that shot." Well, I like it. I left it in. We still love each other. <laughs> um, uh, I would sit, this is just a couple of months ago, I would sit and I would read, you know, I, I get the Boston Globe and the New York Times, it comes in the morning. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you know, I live in an egghead community, what can I say? Um, I would read about the Zubaida tapes. The CIA destroyed two tapes of the interrogation of Zubaida, and waterboarding was supposedly used. People are saying, well, how dare they destroy these tapes? What was, they can't do that. That's a destruction of evidence. That everybody, everybody knows that's a no-no. You can't, you can't do that. I'm thinking, they destroyed all the evidence of a prison that had 10,000 people. No one writes about it. I have Colonel Thomas Pappas's letter ordering the amnesty signed by Colonel Pappas. Couldn't destroy everything, but they made a real effort to erase hard drives, uh, to impound computers, to destroy pictures and documents. Uh, I guess it's just one more unknown story uh, about Abu Ghraib, which I hope will become better known. The paper does two things for me, the paper filling up the room. Uh, there have been 13 separate investigations of Abu Ghraib, congressional military investigations of one form or another. Taguba, Faye Jones, Schmidt Furlow, Schlesinger, and on and on and on. There's even a report, a big fat report, which is a report on the reports. It's the summary report on the 13 reports. Um, they're unreadable. They're heavily redacted. But even if they weren't heavily redacted, they would be, for all intents and purposes, unreadable. Uh, there's several ways that you hide information. One really good way is you just simply burn it. Uh, another way is you, you just provide a tsunami, a paper tsunami, a glut of information and uh, what is relevant, what is pertinent, is hidden in that morass of uh, information. Uh, it's not the needle in a haystack, it's the needle in a hundred billion haystacks. Yes? I have um, a question, it's about the legality um, of your topic, of your movie. I have a 92-year-old next door neighbor who was in World War II and he's always telling me about his war memories and his stories. And he's always saying, um, when Abu Ghraib came out and all the news came out about Abu Ghraib, he just said, and um, this is nothing new. It's been going on for a long, long time. And he says that as a soldier and, and that's his memory. So if that's true, I don't know if that's true, but if that's true and Rumsfeld is free in, in, with the laws here in this country, but I hear that if he were to travel internationally and maybe that's um, erroneous information, that he would be arrested as a war criminal. What, it, what, what are the legalities, the difference? Is it the Geneva Conventions that have been broken, or they've never been broken, or it's okay to break them, or what should we Well, make? all of Abu Ghraib was a violation of Geneva. Everybody here, I'm sure, is familiar with this uh, John Yu torture memo, which was finally released to the ACLU, all 80-some pages of it. Uh, this is 
within the last week or so. Um, so I'm game. I tried to read it. It's unreadable. And not just because it's dense legalese. It's unreadable because it's not written to communicate anything. Yes, there's a discussion of the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth Amendment, international conventions and treaties. You read through this gobbledygook and you get to the final paragraph. And the final paragraph tells you what you need to know, that you didn't have to read the rest of it because the president can decide to do whatever he chooses to do. He's not bound by uh, international treaties. He's not bound by uh, any of the international conventions, all of the Geneva Conventions included. He's not bound by uh, the legislative or the judiciary uh, of this country. He's not bound by anything. He can uh, do whatever he chooses to do by fiat. That's the essence of the U memo. It's important to remember this is not an issue just about torture. Torture is just one very, very, very small aspect of this. Um, uh, this is about actually the wholesale uh, abrogation of everything that we hold dear about this country that we live in. We fought a war uh, because we wanted to free ourselves from a king. Uh, we created a constitutional democracy because we did not want an absolute monarchy of any form. And some 200 years later, we have the opportunity to read this memo by John Yu telling us that that is indeed what we have today. A monarchy, an absolute monarchy, where the President of the United States can do whatever, whatever he chooses to do. Um, that is the really, truly appalling message in the memo. Uh, it kind of left me speechless. Um, odd for me, because I talk a lot. Um, I thought, this is not good. This is not very good at all. Um, but I kept thinking, it's a really important question I think that everybody should ask. Um, if the president really can do what he pleases to do, he can do really anything. Um, it's his choice. It doesn't say in the memo that he's not responsible for those things. And I dare say it's important to remember that indeed he is responsible, and we should impeach. Um, this is just, on some level, deeply un-American. I don't know how else to describe it. It's against everything that makes me proud to be a citizen of this country. Uh, I don't get it, and I don't like it. <laughs> Uh, it's a mystery. It's a mystery why somehow we've been so quiet in all of this. Um, that's the real, the real mystery. You know, it goes back to these soldiers in Abu Ghraib, the ones that you wanted to hear uh, beg us for forgiveness. Um, ask yourself how silent you have been in the face of stuff that you know is wrong a whole goddamn war that everybody probably sitting in this room knows is immoral and wrong. Ask yourself uh, what you're doing. And with that, I think we should probably, probably end. It's a good place to end. Thank you so much.
Can I say one thing? Sorry for talking so much, Mubai.